Big 12 Commissioner Brett Yormark speaks at Big 12 Media Days and says nothing, really? You are Locked On College Football, your daily podcast on all things college football. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Locked On College Football. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day and your daily source to stay up to date with the biggest stories in the greatest sport on planet Earth, realignment, coaching, carousel, the portal, and more. Getting you ready for the season, which is right around the corner. We've always got you covered. This episode brought to you by our friends at FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down. The sports stop sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. That's Drake Toll locked on Big 12 joining me to discuss. I feel like when Brett Yormark wants to say the Big 12 is going shopping, the Big 12 is going to make a move, the Big 12 wants to add teams, I feel like historically, Drake, correct me if I'm wrong, he's just kind of come out and said that. And when he was asked about realignment, he said, quote, I hadn't really thought about how big is too big for a conference. I often get asked about expansion and what's next. I'm really focused on the current composition of our conference. We've expanded a lot. My wife told me the other day when you took the job, you had 10 schools. You have 16 now. That's in a very short period of time, less than 24 months. And quote, that was over on 247sports.com reporting. I feel like that's a, a pretty tame comment by Brett Yormark standards in the realignment space. Yeah, I don't think Brett Yormark was going to give you anything substantial during his comments in Las Vegas this week. And I didn't expect him to. I was on a radio show, uh, 960 ESPN in Salt Lake City the day before. And the question was posed, what will Brett Yormark say? And I didn't expect too much. And we didn't get anything crazy when he got on stage and did the big spiel where he's the head coach of the conference and says, we're a top three league in America. And everybody, yeah. Or, you know, it was it was like, ah, you know, Brett kind of got up there and said what he needed to say. And he didn't ruffle really any feathers or do anything too outlandish. But I'll remind you, last summer when the Big 12 was in early talks with Colorado or right on the top of it, Big 12 media days was around that time, and nobody could have told you substantial evidence at that point that Colorado would join the conference, then Utah, Arizona, Arizona State would follow as well. So I don't know we can exactly derive the Big 12's late next move. Their, their latest moves, we've gotten all the ins and outs. What is their next move? Brett Yormark didn't give it away, but what he did say when he got questioned, when they, you know what they do at media days where the guy gets to the podium and he, does, like, he walks the stage and, oh, I'm the commissioner. And then he does the thing where he gets off the stage and reporters hold cameras in their faces. And that's usually the point where the interrogation gets a little bit more fun. The guy feels a little bit more like, oh, I can say something cool because I'm in this little niche of reporters. And what Yormark said there was, I want to be the number one conference. In the, I will not stop till we're the number one conference in the country. And if that means that you're going to sell the naming rights to the league or put yourself in the best position when it comes to uh, paying student athletes and revenue sharing, that's all great and good. But if you don't expand, these these 16 teams cannot be the number one conference in the country. Maybe I'm reading too far between the lines, but these 16 cannot be number one over the SEC. You're going to have to add something else that's flashy, and your mark has to know that. Yeah, I I think that's a little bit of coach speak from the commissioner because we all know the Big 12 is solidly behind the Big 10 and SEC. There are no moves that can be made, even if the ACC were to disband, which I've said at length, I, I do not anticipate. I think there's a completely viable path forward for the ACC to continue to exist. I've said the same thing, Spencer. What are you talking about? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I bet. So I, I did, you know, see a comment he made about, well, you know, we've positioned ourselves solidly as the number three conference in America. From a stability standpoint, that is true. But if you're on the ACC side of things, without FSU and Clemson, the leagues at the very least are comparable. The Big 12 might have a slight edge. But uh, overall, when I look at the Big 12 and the ACC, I say they are on, at the very least, similar footing. They're in the same tier. Like if you were to divide the Big 10, into three tiers of teams and at the top of tier two you were to put usc and at the bottom of tier two you were to put i don't know ucla for instance you you put them in the same tier you just wouldn't have them right next to each other yeah. that's kind of how i view the the big 12 and the acc not necessarily with that size of a gap but looking at where these leagues stand football wise going forward it, it, assuming fsu and clemson are going to get out of the league which i think you and i both anticipate happening then at the very least, I look at those two conferences and say, there's no reason they can't both exist because one is basically as good as the other. 
And that doesn't even allow for the possibility of programs elevating themselves to strengthen the conference. Yeah, your mark is in a position right now where you're right, coach speak standpoint. He is here at Big 12 Media Days to do what? Beef up the Big 12. One of the statements that I thought was so interesting from him was saying that he felt as though the league, and this is per Brett McMurphy, had underperformed last year, but now says there's a lot of parity, a lot of star power, a very deep conference. Does he think the league is deep enough to make it number one? Does he actually believe that? Or is it is it truly coach speak? And Spencer, to go into what what I think we've we've almost missed the boat. The expansion part is so important, but maybe what your marks really harping on what he did over the course of the early in the week and media days was talk about selling the name of the conference and still looking for the corporate sponsor that's going to take over. And it, it, you know, can we get patches on the officials that are all state or something? How can we make more money to close that gap if we know that even by adding in a dream impossible insane scenario florida state and clemson you still aren't the sec you still aren't the big 10 what can you do from a more micro revenue standpoint to to shorten that i think maybe it's putting patches on your officials maybe it's it's making it the all state 12 that's 10 million extra dollars per school per yeah. year. great bring it on that's the, the all state 12 i mean i like i like i i, I get it I get it. Also, Florida State and Clemson aren't suing to leave the ACC to go to the Big 12. They're going Big 10 or SEC. Unless you're listening to Greg Swim, who is a, <laughs> who is a reputable oh, reporter, has a lot of Twitter followers. Oh, gosh. Um, I don't even know if I want to dive into that. Um, so, so so we shall not. But right. I, th- I think the, the, the naming rights thing is kind of a necessary step almost to stay afloat, even if I don't like it. At the end of the day, does it have a material impact? Yes, in a positive yeah. way. Like the perception of, oh, is it be the All-State 12? Oh, man, that would feel so weird and wrong. Yeah, but if your alternative is that or not being able to be as relevant financially as you possibly can be, because frankly, you could be staring at a deficit compared to ACC schools. If they get a fat settlement from Florida State and Clemson to leave the league, that could be a couple hundred million dollars each. Well, I don't think they're using that to add more schools to the conference, at least not in the short term, I think they're going to use that to fund their athletic departments. So you have to look at revenue if you're the Big 12 and say, anywhere we can get it, you go for it. Uh, you do. And and that's why people are going to scoff at the All-State 12. And, and sure, to me, it is... We're going to call it the Big 12. We we still call – was it you? I think you and I may have had this conversation. It's still Twitter. I still call it's it still Twitter. It's still Twitter. We still call it Twitter. I You're jokingly st- refer to it as X, formerly known as Twitter, but in my daily life, I it, it's Twitter. I tweeted. I went to Twitter.com. We're still going to use that. And Brett Yormark is going to say the Allstate 12 in official statements, and that's what it'll look like when the emails come through from all the media people on that site. And guess what? I don't care. I don't care. You don't care. And, and if it's that money that keeps the conference afloat in a world where a lot of people believe the SEC and the Big Ten have enough power to steer college football in the direction where they want it, and I, that's not shocking. They have they control a whole lot of this thing. The most Big of 12 it. has to play <laughs> catch up yeah. somehow and, and do it. Sell the conference name. Nobody's going to care. Nobody's going to – if it means extra money for the schools, just do whatever. Put the patches on the – make it – like sponsor the halftime shows. I don't give a rip if it makes me – Still host Locked On Big 12 in two years? Good. I don't want to have to lo- host Locked On College Football too. What are we going to do, Spencer, when the Big 12 goes under? There's only one Locked On College Football. Locked On All-State 12? Yes. I, I guess. I can do I, that. I, I feel do like that. I'm I feel like I'm obliged to let you go right now because we're recording, and it's kind of late where you are, and your face looks like a damn cherry tomato I, uh, my at the moment. My ring Just light all. went out. My ring light went out, <laughs> and I am using a very dark yellowish tinted light and now i'm fired up about brett yormark saying nothing now i'm fired up about nothing what else you know what i get fired up about seinfeld and that's a show about nothing so i i think that's as perfect a way as any to end and it's the well segment. written it's damn thank good. you i try um i thought you were talking about my line not the show itself but i'll accept a compliment that you oh, didn't extend anyway drake toll locked on big 12 drake thanks as always spencer i love you Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I also appreciate that Florida State has made a lot of moves in the transfer portal. I just don't know if they've got the quarterback to win a national championship. They did last year. I don't know about this year. We'll talk about that next. 
This episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. I love sports. I love them so much. I never want them to stop. But as the playoffs wind down, we get fewer games and the sports aren't sportsing like I want them to. And FanDuel lets me keep the sports going all summer long, whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up dream up bets any time that I am in the mood. This summer, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Head over to FanDuel.com. Start making the most out of your summer. Bet everything you could possibly want for college football. Every week zero and week one game is available to bet. Just go poke around. Look at the lines. It's fun to see what Vegas thinks about the teams across the country, including yours, win totals, conference title odds, national championship odds. It's all there. Go to FanDuel.com, FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Last year, Florida State was national championship caliber with Jordan Travis at quarterback. Now they've got DJ Uyunglele. Is that really good enough? That's Brian Smith, Locked On Seminoles, joining me here on the show. Let, let's start with that question before we get to the schedule, Brian. Do you think that DJ Uyunglele can be the quarterback of a team that plays for and or wins a national championship? I do not. you got to prove me wrong here, but for four years he's been too inconsistent, especially with accuracy, because he has games where he's hot. Uh, his freshman year he threw for like 420 yards at Notre Dame. I mean, that's insane, but he's had also had games where he threw for like a buck 60, buck 70, and he was just inconsistent, especially on third down. I don't like picking guys that are roller coasters at any spot, but especially behind center. So I say no. Yeah, when I look at him, I'm not the biggest fan. I don't think he's bad. I just don't think that he gets you to a level where you were at with Jordan Travis a year ago. And I know that's a sore spot for FSU fans to hear because, of course, the injury, the playoff debacle, and and yada, yada, yada. But Florida State is now working with a guy who two of the last three years as a starter has been under 60% completion. He's coming from a system at Oregon State with Jonathan Smith that did not require him to do a lot. Now, he won games. He was successful. I'm not sitting here saying that because of DJU, Florida State's about to have a 5-7 and seven just train wreck of a year. I don't think that at all. I just look at them and say, could they win the ACC with him? Maybe, yeah. I, I think that is possible. I think the rest of the roster could carry him to, to that point. I just don't think you can rely on him and – you can't expect him to just suddenly realize that five-star potential in his fifth year. He's been at, at two different schools. This is stop number three. I think he is what he is. He's He's got a high floor. I just don't see the ceiling there to bring you the sort of dynamic playmaking that, that wins you a national championship. That's pretty much where I am. To get to that next level for Florida State, especially they don't have the same depth is let's say Georgia does in the trenches, not that anybody does. you got to make up for it with somewhere else, and the easiest way to do it is quarterback. Well, DJ has never been a dominant guy week to week. Prove me wrong, again, and Florida State's biggest Achilles this year might be the receiver position because they lost two dominant guys in Johnny Wilson and Keon Coleman. So there were some throws last year that Jordan threw, and it was like, oh, where's that going? And they made snags that NFL players do. They're not in Tallahassee anymore. Those balls that go over their head could end up in the hands of a free safety going the other direction this year. That's a concern I have. Now, he's still a big guy that can run a little bit, and they got a very experienced offensive line, very deep. Running back room's great. Tight end, they got a really good one. Kyle Morlock, et cetera. They're going to score. But can they do that in the, what I call the four games? Like every team plays about four games that it's like, okay, talent level's a little different here. Can he be a difference maker in any of those four? They got Miami on the road. They got Notre Dame on the road. They got Clemson at home. They got a kind of a tricky game to open the season, Georgia Tech. It's in Ireland on August 24th. It's bizarre. They got a pretty good offense. If Florida State's D has a little off day, Georgia Tech's going to score. They can score. Their defense is horrendous, but can DJ take advantage of it? So you have chances to trip up, and then they got the Memphis game. They've got Seth Hennigan, a really good quarterback. SMU can score. There's so many possibilities for them to slip up if he has an off day. I just don't know how you can say they're a national title contender unless something really changes. Yeah, I think the rest of the roster is really good, among the best in the ACC, because we're talking about this from a national standpoint, not from an ACC standpoint. You know, where does he fit in in the rankings of the best quarterbacks in the ACC? He's not at the bottom, but he's definitely not at the top for me. He's probably 
you know, just outside of the top tier of guys from what I've seen from him in his career. Whereas you mentioned, he'll have games where he goes 20 and 24 and it's 300 yards and three touchdowns, no picks. And then the next game, he'll complete 50% of his passes. Like this has been a consistent theme. Does Mike Norvell get the best out of him? We've seen coaches revitalize guys before. Certainly Oregon did that with uh, Bo Nix. You talk about Kalen DeBoer and Michael Penix. Like I've seen that take place. I just am not as optimistic that, that Florida State, despite having a great offensive line, which should be a really good consortium of running backs, I don't know that they have everything they need to suddenly make him into you know a, a Heisman guy. And so when, when you look at this at, at the schedule, Brian, the win total, according to our friends at FanDuel, is 9.5. I think that's about right. I don't think Florida State wins fewer than eight games. I think that's just a disaster scenario because Norvell's a really good coach and they have a lot of talent and they're going to win at least that many. The question is, do they get to 10 or 11 in that Notre Dame game on the road? That that one's certainly tough. But when I look at what is their most important game, not just to win the ACC, but to get to the playoff or be an at-large playoff team if they don't win the ACC, I think it's that game October 26th at Miami that that uh, that stands out to me as the game that they've got to have to solidify themselves as having the chance to to prove us wrong and go play for a national championship. If they win there, I mean that's a rivalry game that is part of the reason I love college football. Been watching that game for over 30 years and it's an incredible matchup every time they go at it. Miami Lord only knows what you're going to get week to week. Um they've got Roster-wise, probably the best roster, 1 through 85, in the league. Uh, Whether or not it's the best managed is another story, and I would lean strongly towards no. But at the same time, it's in their house. They've lost to Florida State the last two years. Everybody's talking about that in the state of Florida. It's very important for Mario Cristobal because it's year three for him at his alma mater. That game is going to be wild. And DJ on the road. Not necessarily the guy I'd want to wager on. And they also have Cam Ward, who you know, because he was at Washington State the last couple of years. Uh, he's a fumbling machine, but he's also somebody that can make big plays. He had 14 fumbles last year, which is crazy. But that's it. I mean, everything else is pretty good with him. He's mobile, makes crazy throws, and has an incredible arm. They do some really nuts things. You, against Florida State secondary, you need that, because they, they might have the best overall secondary in the country. It's definitely top 10 conservatively. Florida State and Miami will be a close game. I think between Miami and Clemson at home, FSU probably drops one of those games. Just kind of my feeling. But I think that that flip of I'd rather have Miami on the road than Clemson on the road. Because one one is a far more daunting home environment to go into than than the other. And both are going to be among the best rosters in, in the ACC this year. But... This isn't an impossible schedule. It's not easy. I think it's kind of leaning towards harder than average, but not ridiculously brutal. If you're Florida State, start with Georgia Tech. I agree it's weird. I think they'll be fine. I don't think they can overlook the Memphis game at home. Memphis, I don't either. They, they are the favorites in the American Athletic Conference, and they have the second or third best odds to make the playoff in the entire group of five. They have had a really good transfer portal offseason. They've got a great quarterback in, in Seth Hennigan. And I, I, I'm i not picking FSU to win or to, to lose that football game at home. It's just one that I will not be surprised if I'm scoreboard watching and I look over and, oh, FSU is only up by eight points with, you know, 13 minutes to go in the fourth quarter. No, I, that, that wouldn't surprise me either. Uh, Seth Hennigan, along with – just a few other guys was a really good player as a freshman at the quarterback spot a few years ago. Yeah. One of them just went number one overall in the draft. That's Caleb Williams. So the other one was Drake May. He's pretty good too. It's hard to do that. He's been a dude for them since he arrived at Memphis. He's a Dallas area kid. He's got a really nice arm and he makes reads after the snap. You can't fool him like a lot of other kids. That's why I think he'll end up making an NFL roster, making a nice living for himself. Yeah. If they screw around with that game, that, that could be a problem. SMU's another one like that, too. They got a guy that can throw it. Mm-hmm. The Dallas area kid. Those are tough games. The one saving grace here, or two, if you will, NC State and Louisville are not on the schedule. Yep. NC State's defense is a pain to play for or play against because it's it's unique. 
I think Louisville has one of the best play callers in the country as their head coach. So they do avoid those. Yeah, I think that's where the breaks come in. Like it's a mostly manageable schedule. I don't think any other games are going to trip up Florida State. I think their roster is too good. You know, SMU on the road, yeah, maybe, but I, I think FSU's got a, a big roster gap there. And, and the same applies to Memphis. I just think it's one you can overlook. But, I mean, Cal, Duke, uh, you and I are both low on North Carolina this year. I'm fading North Carolina every chance that, that I get. Florida is at home. I don't think that's going to provide too much of uh, of an issue this year. I mean, they won on the road against Florida last year with – who, who was the quarterback at that time? Was it Brock Glenn? It, true it, freshman. Yeah, yeah, yeah with, a true, with a true freshman. Like, I think they'll I think they'll be all right. Brian Smith locked on Seminoles. Also uh, does some work uh, for on the recruiting side of things for us here at the network. Brian, thanks for stopping by. Thank you, sir. How does LSU win the SEC? We'll talk about that next. Can LSU win the crowded SEC? That's Matt Moscona, our newest host here at the network, returning to Locked On as the host of Locked On LSU. Matt, it's great to have you here on, on the show, and I want to start with that question. You look at the SEC title odds. You see Georgia up there. Of course they should, but you see Texas up there. You see Bama up there. You think about Ole Miss and what they've done this offseason. Do you think LSU is getting overlooked as a team that can win the SEC in 2024? I don't think they're getting overlooked. Um, I think they're right where they deserve to be. Uh, you lose the Heisman Trophy winner at quarterback, two first-round picks at receiver, your offensive coordinator that was a Broyles Award finalist, and last year you literally had the worst defense in the history of the program. LSU, with all of that, doesn't deserve the benefit of the doubt. But they're a team ranked just on the fringe of the top 10, top 15, and they're a team that if you look at, at preseason odds and win totals they're a team that's favored in every game except the road game against a&m so i think there's there is warranted respect for lsu given all of those things but also much warranted skepticism as well so you know, spencer i think most people look at the sec and say all right you got georgia texas and those two teams if, if they're not in the 12 team playoff something went horribly wrong and then there's that group of Alabama, Ole Miss, Tennessee, LSU, Missouri that all think they're going to be at least 10 and 2 and be in the playoff. But everybody can't make it. Yeah. I think you've got at least four of those five fan bases that are going to be really upset uh, come the beginning of December. And how many SEC, well, how many SEC teams do you think are getting in the playoff? My, my pick has been four. I think five is the max. Oh, wow. But I can't see it being under three. So that's why I've landed on four. I think that's the number. So I've actually done this exercise gone going back and looking at the number of years where you've had double I think, would you agree with me like you have to be 10 and 2 yes like, yeah okay yes i agree so, the number of years where uh the teams that would be 10 and 2 and that would ha would take one of seven at large spots um you're generally going to land on three as a guarantee and i think four would be the stretch i think I find it hard to believe you ever see a year where you get five, where three of the seven at large are from the SEC. Um, I just don't know that the committee is going to allow that to happen in the, same, in the same way that a bunch of humans sat in a room and decided that an undefeated Florida State team was not worthy. Like They'll do whatever they need to do to make it look the way they want it to look, and I don't think it's going to look like us, the SEC getting five of 12 bids ever. I think five is the upper limit as i said here's where i come down though and we won't have the florida state discussion right now because i just learned that we disagree on something but that's okay <laughs> so uh, i think that for for the sec your two teams that get to the conference championship game are quite often almost always 12 and 0 or 11 and 1 those two teams are a lock somebody else is 10 and 2 somewhere that team is going to get in. Oftentimes, there's even another team that can get to 10 and 2. Now, that depends on schedules because you might have some SEC cannibalization to keep teams out. But the reason I, I look at five, I was talking about this with Luke Robinson of Locked On Alabama earlier this week. Nine and three in the SEC, depending on your schedule, who you have wins against, will get at the very least consideration from the committee compared to 
a double digit win team in the ACC or the Big 12, especially going forward in a post FSU Clemson ACC, that league is going to be diminished. But you look at what not reduced to nothing, but it's not going to be as strong. You look at what the Big 12 is now. I do not see how a Big 12 team can put together a schedule or a resume at 10 and 2 that is decidedly and markedly above what a 9 and 3 SEC team is able to put together. Again, schedule dependent, but on the whole, you're just not going to have that many national. You don't have any national title contenders in the Big 12. You have several that you go up against in the SEC. And two years ago, we saw TCU in a college football playoff national championship game. So weird things happen. It's college football. That's true. That's true. And you can do That's a 12 true. Playoff. I'll tell you what, what I think is, Spencer, the, the biggest uh, pivot that we'll see is because you've done away with divisions, you've effectively eliminated the possibility ever of – of South Carolina getting back to an SEC championship game, of Mississippi State getting to an SEC championship game, Arkansas, like Missouri, it'll never happen again because there's no division. So or you can even look at like Iowa in, um, you could look at Iowa, all those Big Ten West teams, all those years that were, all you had to do was beat Wisconsin. Yeah, you beat Wisconsin and Northwestern and boom, you're in a Big Ten championship game. That'll It'll never happen again without division. So I think that's the biggest change that's coming as a result. I'm sorry about my, my son being a little noisy. Oh, no, 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 no worries. No worries whatsoever. I think people can can handle it and such. Oh, but that's your life, man. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody, if you are watching and you have children, you understand. That's like one of the things we all learned on COVID, like newscasters with their kids walking in. Yeah. <laughs> like, we get it, man. We get it. Yeah, I, I mean, never, never say never is, of course, the, uh, the age old, old statement. And I agree. I, mean, look, I, I agree. I agree. It's difficult. But I mean, you also have programs right now that are operating at a high level and it feels like they'll be at a high level forever. But if I told you in the 90s, by the way, one day Nebraska and Miami are going to struggle to make bowl games. They would have said, you're what are you talking about? You that's not you can't they can't fall down that way. Like you never know. Mismanagement can go up to the, the highest levels sometimes, even in a sport as great and as popular as college football. But bringing this back to LSU's team for a moment. I think their offensive line is among the best in the SEC. They've got two tackles that regularly get first-round NFL draft grades. That is an exceedingly rare proposition. I think that helps Garrett Nussmeyer, who certainly is not going to have two first-round ready receivers to throw to on the outside. Brian Kelly, year three, a quarterback who I think I believe in, I think, but not entirely certain just yet, capable offensive line, revamped defensive staff. Might this just come down? They're contending for an SEC championship in a legitimate way. Might it just come down to whether that defensive staff has got the horses to get them there? I think that's 100% the answer. I don't think LSU's offense is going to be the best in college football again. Like, I mean, LSU led, led college football in scoring and total offense last year. I don't think they're going to be that good again. But, you know, I think the real question is, can the defense be good enough? Can the defense be good enough to, to offset a really, a really good offense? I think the, I'll put it to you this way. The LSU's offense is going to be good enough to beat any team that they play on a given day. The defense just has to be literally not the worst in the history of the program, which was the case a year ago. So, I mean, Spencer, I, I tell people this often. If you remember that 2019 LSU team, which was a, a great team that everybody remembers and won a national championship with Joe Burrow and all those guys, that defense was ranked 59th in the country in total defense. They weren't exceptional. They had some great talent, but they were great when they needed to be great, and they were good enough to complement the best offense in the country. Um, I think that's similar for this year. Um, there's plenty on the offensive side, man. They're going to be they're going to be good and score a lot of points against everybody they play. The defense just needs to be like, you don't have to be top 10 or top 20, but could you be like top 60? It, it's so funny that this is the way you're framing this LSU season because the same can be said for LSU's week one opponent, USC, who oh, yeah. a year ago, everyone was saying, look, you don't have to be Utah or Oregon or Oregon State defensively in the Pac-12 a year ago. Can you just be... Like, Cal, can you just be like ASU? Can you just be all right? And they couldn't, and they went 7-5. and five. And so that week one matchup, your snapshot 
I'll get you out of here on this. Uh, your, your snapshot of that game against USC in Las Vegas. I think it's incredibly losable for LSU, despite their status as a six and a half point favorite. I think USC is good. I love their defensive coordinator higher. I think this is a battle of which new defensive staff is more capable of making an instant impact. You know that, um, by the way, LSU has lost four consecutive season openers. So Not nothing, should, nothing should be considered a given for LSU in that opener against SC. I'm sure the comment section will agree. Uh, I, I, they, they should. Um, you know that Spider-Man meme where it's like the Spider-Man looking at each point at each other? That's LSU and USC. <laughs> I mean, they both yes, are, they are. Third, third year head coaches, uh, replacing Heisman winning quarterbacks, new defensive coordinators off of teams a year ago that their defenses were atrocious. I mean, it is really both fan bases that have tremendous expectations. I mean, this really is like each team looking in a mirror at, at the other. So I think I like Garrett Nussmeyer better than Miller Moss. I, I don't know that I can tell you LSU's defensive talent is any better than SC's, but it may not have to be. It's really going to be who's competent defensively and who makes the fewest mistakes. I mean, I I think that's what it comes down to. But, you know, if LSU wins that game out the shoot, they got a great shot to start 5-0, and and then, man, you look at that game in October against Ole Miss, and I think that's the game Circle that really determines if LSU is a yeah. Big contender. Yeah, I think, I think that's their most important game is that matchup with Ole Miss. Win or lose against USC, I think that game comes down to define what their season uh, ends up looking like. Why don't we call week one LSUSC? And we'll just kind of go from there because they're so similar. Matt Moscona locked on LSU. Check them out on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Matt, thanks so much. Thanks, Spencer. Appreciate everyone listening. I will see you next time. And until then, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.